Hello, and welcome to the second of two videos regarding cultural heritage digitization, based on one of the activities of the SOS Heritage European Project, a desk research aimed at identifying and sharing good practices for digital creation and the digital promotion of cultural heritage. In the first video, we took a closer look at the digitization of cultural heritage and we examined its benefits as well as some of its drawbacks. Now we look at a case study, the Handbook of Good Practices for Digitalization and Promotion of Cultural Heritage. In this video, we will first take a look at the SOS Heritage Project's rationale and goal, following which we will examine one of its specific objectives, the desk research on identifying good practices of digital content creation and communication related to cultural heritage, following which we will highlight some engaging examples of digital creation and communication. So, what is SOS Heritage? SOS Heritage is a Creative Europe project led by Mazzini Lab, an Italian company. The consortium has four partners from Austria, Italy, Romania and Serbia. The project leader is Mazzini Lab, an Italian benefit company with expertise on cultural heritage digitization, the development of communication projects and on training and consultancy. The partners are the University for Continuing Education Krems in Austria, which through the Center for Cultural Property Protection, has expertise in research and training. Atsi from Italy, a national network of owners and managers of historical houses focusing on family and private archives. The Transylvania Trust Foundation, a foundation from Romania whose main goal is the protection and enhancement of Transylvanian built heritage. And the National Museum of Krushevac from Serbia, a national museum protecting and exhibiting many different types of collections. The main objective of the SOS Heritage Project is to create a set of good practices for the management and enhancement of the cultural sector, ensuring it has a good capacity to react and resist the challenges arising from climate change. This goal is accomplished through a structure of three specific objectives. Objective 1 to share and test best practices of digital content creation and communication for successful stakeholders and community engagement. Objective two, to develop and test a web app designed to help professionals handle their risk assessment procedures and produce risk management plans in an immediate digital way. And objective three, to develop and test a training course on risk management of cultural heritage targeted at owners, managers, and professionals, the one that you are currently attending. Let us now focus on the first specific objective. A first step of this objective was a desk research that focused on identifying good practices of digital content creation and communication related to cultural heritage. Each partner of the consortium had the task of gathering 20 good practices, totaling in the end in 100 good practices for digital content creation and communication. The findings of the desk research were then summarized in the Handbook of Good Practices for Digitalization and Promotion of Cultural Heritage, which was step two. The third step is for three of the consortium partners to implement their own local actions in terms of digital content creation and communication. Let us now look at the desk research methodology. The first step prior to the actual desk research was to establish the parameters of the research. However, not wishing to limit the geographical or thematic scope of the research, any kind of digitization pro process, any kind of digitization process could be considered, mainly focusing on local and European initiatives, but also with the possibility to look for excellent examples in other parts of the world. In terms of type of cultural heritage to consider, given the partners' varied past experiences and main interests, the best results could be obtained if they focused on areas and topics that they knew best. But this limitation was not imposed at all. Still, to convey somewhat of a structure to the research and the presentation of the results, certain heritage categories were selected to focus upon. From the start, it was determined that the domain of research would be tangible cultural heritage. For the categories, these could be both movable and immovable. For the latter, historic monuments and sites, public monuments as well as archaeological sites were considered. As for the former, 
The main categories were fine or visual arts, applied or decorative arts, archaeological objects, and archival material. In terms of the heritage holder, partners were encouraged to consider both public and private, local and national, or even international entities, and digitization projects, with the purpose of seeing how these different institutions deal with digitization initiatives given their varied financial possibilities and networks. In terms of the outputs, no restrictions were set. The 100 examples feature separate websites dedicated to a single project, in many cases an institution's website hosts the digital content, and some newer trends such as AR and VR applications or gamification of heritage are also present. Regarding the selection criteria for the best examples, the following were considered. Quality of the digital content, how accurate is the information, how well researched, how much scientifically grounded, etc. Comprehensibility and accessibility for the general public. How well is the information presented? Is it available in English? Does it have other features for accessibility? Is it a free resource, etc.? Interactivity, looking at the level of interactivity and public engagement, if the audience has a chance to interact with certain elements, can they contribute, etc. Innovation and scalability, can it be reproduced, extended on a larger scale, etc. So, let's look at the findings. But first, a disclaimer. As the partners considered mostly examples from their own regions and areas of expertise, the results of the desk research are unable to claim general validity. And indeed, the aim was not to have findings that are universal. Instead, the focus was oriented more towards those digitization projects that would serve as good examples and sources of inspiration for various future projects and initiatives. Geographically, due to the partnerships focused, Almost every example of good practice is from Europe. In terms of the institutions that created the digital content, most were public institutions as opposed to private or mixed entities. Almost half of the projects were created in the framework of corporations, most of these being public institutions, while private and mixed entities being less well represented, with funding sources having an almost equal distribution between governmental funding international and EU grants, as well as private and own or mixed funding. Regarding the type of cultural heritage that was digitized, within most heritage digitization projects, the collections belong to several categories, as, for example, a museum can hold various objects, from paintings to small finds, from weapons to industrial design objects. Thus, within the desk research, the various targeted heritage categories are featured as follows holdings belonging to the fine arts or visual arts category, paintings, wall paintings, sculpture, reliefs, graphic arts, were digitized in 47 of the cases. Holdings belonging to the applied arts or decorative arts category, meaning textiles, ceramics, decorative or household objects from various materials in 31 cases, archaeological material in 29 cases, Archival material, meaning various documents, correspondences, manuscripts, archival photographs or postcards, but also books or periodicals in 52 cases, while historical monuments, buildings, sites, structures in 32 cases. The fact that the categories of visual arts, especially the graphic arts subcategory, which features at 57% of all fine arts category mentions, and archival material are overrepresented is due to the fact that a large number of archives were selected with a great amount of paper-based holdings, the digitization process of which might be more readily accessible through digital photography and scanning as compared to 3D scannings of buildings or LiDAR surveys, which are more expensive methods. Regarding the types of digital content, Given that one single project can include several types of digital content that many times complement each other in terms of what they offer, digital collections or databases are the most prominent, followed by virtual tours and video content. Newer technologies such as 3D models, reconstructions, AR and VR are featured less prominently, while educational games are a relatively new trend that will certainly be more prevalent in the future. 
The desk research analyzed other aspects as well, but we shall not dwell on those for the moment. Instead, let us look at some examples of good practices that were highlighted in the handbook. Firstly, an explanation. As it would have been too complicated to describe all 100 examples of good practices, instead 25 were selected to be featured and described in more detail. These 25 were grouped according to categories of experiences, meaning from the point of view of the digital contents user. As a consequence, four main categories of examples could be distinguished. The first category is digital collections. The simplest and perhaps most logical way of presenting a group of heritage items, be they historic monuments, archaeological sites, archival or other types of collections. This is the largest category featured and, in fact, possibly the earliest examples of digitized heritage projects have employed this method. From the user's perspective, we are dealing with a collection of items that have been gathered and curated. The user only to navigate the page, accepting the logic of the display and select, read and view what they need or want. This category might not offer an exciting narrative or adventure, however, it is always the basis of any digital or indeed analog collection or database. The first example that we see is the Web GIS of the Cultural Heritage of Emilia Romagna from Italy. The project is particularly relevant because it represents a virtuous example of post-emergency resilience and, for this reason, it retraces the fundamental topic of the SOS Heritage Project. In fact, the project represents an integrated collection of prestigious places and buildings in the Emilia-Romagna region. The project was initiated following the major earthquake that hit the area in 2012. On the map it is possible to browse all the historical, artistic and archaeological assets that have been registered uh, and for each of them detailed information can be obtained on the property, including information regarding the damage suffered due to the earthquake. The second example is the Living Danube Limes web app, created through the Danube Transnational Program by institutions from several European countries that are found along the Danube River. The app highlights the common heritage of these countries and the potential it holds for future development. It contains information on Roman sites along the Danube, museums and visitor centers, as well as VR reconstructions that were made for selected pilot sites. The second major category invites users on a journey via the virtual tours, where they, most times, have the power to discover and navigate rooms, exhibitions, heritage sites by themselves. This category is closely tied to spaces and to the emergence of various technologies that allow content creators to map and scan in three dimensions. The category includes 3D renditions of historic places and spaces, as well as museum exhibition spaces. The first highlight is Bagan, Myanmar, Valley of 10,000 Temples, from the country of Myanmar. It is a narrative, immersive virtual tour exploring three Buddhist temples in Bagan, which were affected by earthquakes, representing an excellent case study for the digitization, as well as promotion of built cultural heritage under threat. The tour tells a visual story, at the same time allowing the user to explore the monuments, to focus on some of the details, which triggers further narration. We also need to mention the Karnotu map, from Austria, which with augmented reality, virtual reality, and the virtual reality 3D mode, offers three different ways of experiencing the tour of the archaeological park. It is remarkable due to the quality of its content, and the app format ensures its accessibility, interactivity, and innovation component. The third major category is perhaps the most fun, and indeed engaging way of presenting heritage, especially when targeting younger audiences, gamification. Scavenger hunts and other types of games developed on the basis of cultural heritage require direct action from the users who discover the past, different cultures and their heritage values via their smartphones, tablets or other technologies. Here we highlight only one example, Archaeotales, Explore Archaeological Remains, the result of an international cooperation. 
It is an online application designed to facilitate the playful communication of knowledge about archaeological sites and cultural heritage. It works like an interactive scavenger hunt to explore archaeological remains. Archaeotales can take visitors through a classic exhibition scenario, but it also offers the possibility of combining the experience with outdoor installations or even taking it into the public realm. The last major category has the potential to create the deepest bonds between people and heritage, even though many times we are talking about collections. This is crowdsourcing. This method of heritageization relies heavily on the heritage items of people, mainly in relation to personal and family objects and recent past. It relies on our nostalgia, on our personal histories, but it also encourages a feeling of responsibility towards our common heritage. On the other hand, it enables institutions such as museums, archives and libraries to harness the collective knowledge and expertise of the public to preserve and showcase their collections. Let's look at two examples, both from Italy. The first one is the network of photographic collections in Campania from Italy, representing a very interesting example of creating a collective archive. The site collects historical photographs of the community that inhabits the province of Salerno in the Campania region, which is a particularly important region for Italian history, as studying the life, migrations and professions of its inhabitants allows us to reconstruct some of the most important historical stages of the nation. The archive allows the collaboration of citizens. Anyone in possession of photographs concerning the region can submit them and expand the archival collection. The second example is Aqua Granda. The entire archive is built on the basis of user interventions. Everyone must upload photos, audio and video content and other materials relating to high tide phenomena in the city of Venice. In this way, the digital archive becomes a collection of points of view and personal or intimate stories about a collective phenomenon that influences the life of the entire community. Furthermore, the theme of climate change and the risks deriving from it is very present. High tide phenomena in Venice are increasingly frequent and increasingly destructive. The example is also interesting as it is a new way of archiving exploiting the massive use of smartphones and digital devices that we use every day to build a collective memory. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you liked what you saw. For further information on the project, visit the SOS Heritage website. And if you would like to see more examples of good practices for heritage digitalization, download the Handbook of Good Practices for Digitalization and Promotion of Cultural Heritage. Goodbye.